light bulb that he invented, he wouldn't be the guy inventing the light bulb, right? Because how many filaments did he have to go through before he found the one that worked? Over a thousand. Right? It was a lot. Okay? Over a thousand. So you see, he wasn't content, but you have to understand what the Bible talks about, about this kind of contentment. All right? Now, how many of you have graduated from college? Raise your hand. How many of you graduated from high school? Raise your hand. Okay? So us graduating from high school outnumber you guys graduating from college. Now, those of you who graduated from high school probably had a harder time making a good living, depending on the years that you were born. And if you only graduate high school now, it's going to be a lot harder than it was in my day. Because at least in my day, if you just went through high school, you could do construction and make a good living. That's not that way anymore. Okay? But, I graduated high school, and I worked in the uh, uh, golf course industry. I cut grass on the golf course. I got paid minimum wage. And I realized that that wasn't enough to support a family. So if I was content with that, my family would be hurting. Okay? So I realized when I became an Adventist that I couldn't work at the golf course because they made you work on Saturday. Okay? And so I got fired. And then I started working for Florida Hospital. And that solved this Sabbath issue. Okay? But I worked for them for three years and realized what they paid the groundskeepers wasn't enough to support a family. And I stopped doing all kinds of drugs and I had a lot of energy that needed to be focused somewhere. Okay? And, and on honest things. And work was the best thing that ever happened to me. Okay? Uh, it allowed me to mature, grow up, and realize what it takes in this life to uh, take care of the family, uh, and also to stay out of trouble. What's the old axiom, idle hands, or what? Yeah. You know who they wrote that for? Me. <laughs> 52 years old, idle hands are still the devil's workshop. I have to stay busy, because if I don't, I drive myself crazy. And anybody around me, namely my wife. <laughs> So, I understand when I talk about contentment, what I'm talking about, okay? God blesses you. Is that right? Now, if you lost your job and you need another job and you don't take the time or the effort to ever go looking for another job, you really think you're going to get another job? God is not just going to open that door and throw it in your face. Sometimes He does. But most of the time, He doesn't, okay? So... The contentment is understanding how God is working in your life, where you are at, at this point in time, where God has brought you to, and being content with that. Whether it's in plenty or whether it's in want. Do you understand that? That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. What does that word sanctification mean? To be made holy. Have you ever wondered how a fallen, unholy race becomes holy? The Bible over and over and over again tells you to be holy. How can I be holy? I'm not holy. Outside of Jesus Christ, raise your hand if you're holy here. Look around because ain't nobody raising their hand. We're all in the same boat. Understand that? And yet, what does God require from us? Holiness. Holiness. Here, if you guys were Baptists, okay, let's just say you're Baptist for the next three minutes, okay? So, you've heard this before. If you were Baptist, if you were to die tonight, and you met God after your death, and He asked you, why should I let you in? What would you say? Once saved, always saved. Because you're a good Baptist, so would that work? Here's a way an Adventist would phrase that question. When you stand in front of God, 
And you're given an account for everything you've done in this body. And God asked you, why should I let you in? What will you say to him? Say it out. I have the robe of righteousness from your son. Very good. You know, they asked, this is at um, uh, R.C. Sproul, you ever, you're familiar with him? He runs a seminary in San the, the Reformed Theological Seminary. Okay? Uh, he asked a number of their students on campus, you know, again, if you died and you went to heaven and God asked you, why should I let you in? Their responses were, this one kid said, I have lived 17 years and I've been good all my life. You have to let me in. <laughs> Another response was, well, you know, my, my good deeds have outweighed my bad deeds, so God will let me in. Another one said, what are you going to say? You're going to stand before a holy God. i got nothing to say. Either you're coming or you're going. And I believe I'm going. <laughs> if God requires holiness, how can you who are not holy be holy? You are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification. What sanctification mean? To set apart, to be made holy. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Okay? Justification is the work of a moment. Justification and sanctification go hand in hand. Okay? But you are sanctified because of the Spirit. Unto, what's this word? Obedience. Obedience to what? To God's will. Obedience to God's will, and also obedience to God. How do you offer obedience to God? You listen to Him, right? Amen. Obedience to God, and here, make sure you're clear on this. What's disobedience to God? No. Sin. Heard it, right? Disobedience to God is sin. Obedience to God would be the opposite of disobedience to God. Is that right? We're fallen sinful people. How can we offer obedience to God? How can we be holy? And that is why it all focuses right here on this one word, and that is the Spirit of God. Right? It is the Spirit of God who allows you and gives you obedience. And it is through the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ that you have grace and you have peace. This is what God has done for you. Now this is just the first two, three, four, I haven't even got the five, verses of Peter. Do you see how deep Peter theology has become? You read this book, and you start reading it, and you start understanding what Peter is saying, because, believe me, as you get further into this book, there is a couple things here that he says are quite hard to understand. He's right up there with Paul. I think those two sat together, had a meeting, and then Peter wrote this part. That's hard to understand. That's hard, not this part here. Okay, but I want you to understand what this verse 2 means to you. This is saying you. Put your name in here where it says elect. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you're elect, and your name can go right in here. Marilyn, you're called according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And Marilyn, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied, because God loves you. You are important to Him, and He has given His Son so that you can have an inheritance, incorruptible, waiting for you, that on that day, it can't be given to anybody else, it will never be stolen, it will never be used except for you. That's what God has done for you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to, what? His abundant mercy. If you ever wonder sometimes what God the Father is really like, a being so powerful that he can speak worlds into creation. A being that emanates light and a being, a being that is pure holiness. 
What is He like? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant... What's that word abundant mean? Lots. Lots. Right? Lots. God's mercy knows no limits. It cannot be contained and it cannot be wore out. Bless you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again. You understand what this next phrase means? If He has begotten us again, that means something happened before this, right? That through Adam, and because of Adam and Eve's choice, when you were born, you were born with the results of their choice, yeah. right? It says that through one man, sin entered the world, right? Now, here's something very quick for you to think about. Okay. Who was the first man? Adam. Who was the first woman? Eve. Okay, so if Adam and Eve were the first couple, were there anybody else? No. no. Here, here, when God created, you have day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. When he gets to the point where he makes man, who's the first man that he created? And he formed him out of the dust, right? And then he took a rib, and he took that rib, formed out of the dust, who? Eve. And the two of them were the first people on this earth. Is that right? Yes. So if anybody ever asked you, well, where did Cain get his wife from? What's the answer? Yes. It came from Adam and Eve. It was part of the family. Now, here's the thing that the Bible says about Eve. In Genesis chapter 5, she is the mother of all mankind. There's that word mankind, right? If there was another couple, had to take another couple, because if Adam knew Eve and then knew somebody else, he'd sin. Because okay? in the beginning, God created a male and female, and they were to be married forever together, one to the other, right? So, you have people that say, well, it can't be God had to make a whole other race. Well, the problem with that is that the bloodline of Christ, who the salvation comes through, was Adam and Eve. If he created a whole other race so that Cain could get a wife and it wouldn't be incest, if Adam and Eve fell, what happened to this other race? The Bible never tells you whether they fell or not. This has everything to do with your salvation. If Cain got away from them and Cain came from a fallen line of Adam and Eve, and this line had no sin, that wouldn't work. Right? Makes no sense. So, what's the answer to Cain getting his wife? When Adam and Eve were created, their DNA and their bloodline was pure. Yeah. There was no genetic defects. Why is there a prohibition against incest? And when was it given? It was given back in the book of Deuteronomy, no, Leviticus. Okay? And it was given in the time of Moses. Do you understand that Paul himself says that the antediluvian world where there wasn't no law? There's no sin. There's no sin? Hence, incest wasn't a problem. The bloodlines were pure. If God created Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful and multiply, who did he expect them to get their spouses from? But here's the thing. How many years from the death of Abel to the birth of Seth was it? It's 130 years. If it only took nine months to create a baby, how many babies could you have in 130 years? Here's another thing, too. We are under the assumption that Cain and Abel were born back to back. Does the Bible actually tell you that? No. no. It doesn't mention any daughters. It just mentions Cain and Abel. What you don't know is if there were children born between them. But even if there wasn't, between Abel's death and Seth, 130 years. If it took them 40 years to grow into manhood, how many different offspring could be offspringing from the offspring? 
Do you see how you have more than just Cain, Abel? Wow, where did the girl come from? Okay. It didn't even have to be his sister. It could have been a niece. But in the end, it doesn't matter because the bloodlines were pure. But understand this. When it comes to salvation, hold that question. If there was a whole other race that God created, what happened to them? Because it only tells you that Adam and Eve fell. Right? If it tells you about them being in the garden, it tells you that they ate the forbidden fruit, and they didn't come from the lineage of Adam and Eve. They, were, they would be a whole different creation. Christ didn't come through their line. You don't have two separate bloodlines of saved and unsaved. You have a world that has fallen, and they're fallen because of Adam's sin. Right? Sure. So the other explanation is unscriptural, Amen. unbiblical, and cannot be sustained through Bible study. Amen. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> All right, so. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again. Meaning that through the death of Adam, we became sinners and we, not the death, the sin of Adam, we became sinners and death came to our entire race. Amen. So God has begotten, what does this word begotten mean? Yes. Say it out. Okay. Is that the only meaning of that word? No. Because Jesus is referred to as the first begotten of the Father. The first of its kind. Unique. But also... Four. Jesus said, if you want to get into heaven, you must, he told us to Nicodemus, you must be what? Born again. Born again. Okay? So, through the abundant mercy of the Father, he has begotten us again unto a what? Lively. Lively. That could also be translated living. And I like the word living better. Right? He has begotten us again. He's made us alive again unto a living hope. What's that living hope? The resurrection of of Jesus Christ from the dead. What gives you hope over death? Because Jesus conquered death. Because He took on humanity and He died in that humanity and He rose again the third day so that death no longer has a hold over humanity. Okay, I'm going to close you, but I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think about this for a week. I asked this in my Sabbath school class. If God requires perfect holiness for salvation, and that's what He requires, that's what the, where the bar is set. The bar is set that you never sin once. How does God make unrighteous people righteous? How does God make unholy people holy? How did what Jesus did, how did that make you holy? And that's where you get the silence. Was it magic? No. Did you just say, okay, well, if, if I killed my son, let me ask you a question. Who killed Christ on the cross? What was he dying for? Now, he was dying for the penalty of your sin. Who was initiating that penalty? Satan. So, there you go. You, you guys got it right. But this is a no, no, not Satan. Who do you have to pay for the sins in your body? God. So when Christ was dying on the cross, who was the one that was executing him? This is what you need to understand about God. It takes blood to save or for the remission of sin, right? It takes blood. So when Christ died on the cross, it was His Father who was executing Him. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. You guys need to understand the depth of what that means. The depth of what the Father was willing to do to save you and I. You understand that? But what took place? There is a science of salvation. Just like the science of looking inside the human body to see how it works, how all the parts fit together, how the heart pumps blood throughout the, uh, the blood 
circular system, how that goes to one organ, that organ provides this and that to help the body function. You get down on the molecular level, there are, is a science for that as well, right? So there is a science for salvation. How does a holy God take an unholy race and make them holy? Something that Jesus did, did that for you. What was it? Okay, was it just his death? Was it just the shedding of his blood? That's what I want you to think about next week, and we'll look at that even more. This is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, which according to his abundant mercy, has begotten you again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This God is able to take unholy people and allow them to stand before him, and he will welcome you into heaven as if you've never sinned. Okay? And he is able to tell all the unfallen inhabitants of heaven and the universe that you're safe. You'll be a good thing for the people. You'll be good neighbors. And they'll say, yes, I believe you. What did it? I want you to think about this because we're gonna this 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 was the whole controversy between Martin Luther and the Catholic Church. And when he stood before the deed of Worms, this is what they were talking about. Righteousness by faith. What allows a holy God to allow unholy people to be seen as holy? What took place to allow that to happen? That's what we'll look at next week. Our closing hymn is hymn number 428.
of Jesus, or the life and death of Jesus, that allow you to be made righteous. Not just a pretend righteousness, but real righteousness. That you are holy. What took place? You got two weeks. Think about it. Study it. And see if you can come up with an answer. And when I come back, we'll talk about it. Shall we bow our heads? Heavenly Father.